So I'm Dave Ferguson. I chair the Department of Technology and Society at Stony Brook University. I'm also Associate Provost for Diversity and Inclusion. I've been involved with the sensor since the beginning of the program and very excited about many of the applications of civic engagement. So David, um, let me ask you um, what attracted you to uh, the sensor program originally, if you can remember. So there were, there were two things. One being that uh, I, for a long time, have been involved in sort of science, society, uh, technology issues. And so sensors seemed very compatible with the kinds of things that my department had been doing. That was the first kind of attraction. But then I had never experienced this kind of national or global use of civic engagement. So I thought that the whole idea was intriguing of bringing together people from many disciplines to look at something like uh, civic engagement. And, and so I thought also that it would appeal to people who normally may not think that science is appropriate for them. So, so this kind of sort of broad-based approach, civic engagement kind of idea, I thought was a very intriguing idea. And when we first met, we met when you were the director of the Teaching Excellence Center. Yes. And you were concerned with improving instruction. Uh, and I'm, throughout my experience with Censor, I've been concerned with improving in, in instruction. As you said, when we first met, I was director of the Center for Excellence in Learning and Teaching at Stony Brook. So I was already working with faculty members across a number of areas. But many of the faculty members almost considered it punitive to be involved in sort of teacher development things, especially at Stony Brook University. And to try to bring an idea of engagement, civic engagement, and, and do faculty development through a route like that seemed much more intellectually challenging and, and stimulating. And we had, uh, we had some evidence from a course that one of your colleagues did that simply um, focusing on a complex topic, in that case HIV, helped improve learning in both, I think it was calculus, chemistry, yes. and physics. Yes. Or was it not a learning yes. community or something? Yes. In fact, um, there were a number of people who were involved with the HIV, the health issues, you know, Helen LeMay and history certainly was one of the people that got me involved in thinking about a lot of the civic issues. And to think about mathematics in this kind of context is sort of naturally arising from studying certain kinds of problems or issues. Although we didn't have math in the original. Not in the original. But we then developed. Well, let's talk about math for a moment. You wrote a, um, a background paper for us on using civic issues to improve mathematics education. And that was based on some experience that you had. you want to talk about the experiences in your classroom? Okay, so great. This is an uh, interesting kind of idea because I've been involved with, with the notion of mathematics as being taught as a part of liberal education for a long time. And I have, of course called Patterns of Problem Solving. I had been working on that course many years prior to Censor. So, you know, it had the element of trying to present certain ideas of modeling, for example, within a very general kind of context. But I think the course kind of lacked a soul. And, and, and one of the things that I feel that, that Censor did was it kind of gave a soul to the course because now I could focus on this issue of civic engagement, I could take modeling and put it in the context of decision making and having students look at real issues related to transportation, issues related to en environmental issues and parks and, and wildlife populations and all this kind Removing of... Removing dead deer from the road. Removing dead deer from the road. In fact, one of the students that uh, got very excited about this course uh, was looking at the deer population on Long Island and the issue of how to control the deer population. So he, he became quite an expert in studying issues of sort of that aspect of wildlife issue and ended up doing some basic modeling within the course and got himself hired by the parks uh, and, and now is very excited in the work that he's doing. I, you know, uh, this might seem like a bit of a digression, but uh, modeling is, is, is a principal area of your 
the intellectual interest and your teaching interest, isn't it? And do you, you know, can you say why you think modeling is so important as a essentially a strategy that we need to have to deal with any uh, complex problem? See, I just think that when we try to deal with real world issues, issues of numbers and measurement, data, all of these things come naturally into play. You know, we feel like we don't have a handle on things unless we're able to quantify them in some kind of way. The issue of what is made, kind of put, put them into some kind of order. So I just think that modeling is just fundamental to any serious application of mathematics. That you really, you know, that we're not dealing with exactly reality. But we're taking reality and we're building some kind of artifact. And we're using that to answer certain kinds of questions about reality. We're using it to make predictions. We're using it to try to understand the current situation as it relates to climate or it relates to traffic situation. How do we try to explain what the traffic problems are without getting our hands around some of the issues of congestion and, and, and those kinds of issues. So this whole notion of sort of building these artifacts to try to understand phenomena and to predict uh, phenomena, it just seems to be so fundamental. And I just think modeling is something that everybody needs to have a grasp of sort of uh, that idea. Of and of course, depending on the kind of model, you can get very different results, right? You can get different it's results does demonstrate yes. so nicely in that food background or about yes. hunger. Yes. Um, but you almost have to have a model as a way of carrying out your theory about how something will get resolved or work or something. Yeah, I, I tell people that, that students that models are tentative conceptualizations of the world. That's the way that I look at it. That it's a way of trying to simplify and get one's hands around certain issues in the world. And you're asking them to, to apply those, that's those skills to important civic questions yeah. and interests them. Absolutely. I'm, I'm asking them to look around <coughs> and think about problems and issues, etc. And what's the relationship of quantitative thinking to those problems? How would they try to, you know, if it's transportation issues or whatever, or if it's waste issues and, and, you know, things having to do with recycling or whatever, you know, how does one try to define specific problems or issues within that context? And how does one try to approach those problems? And then from a quantitative point of view, typically we end up trying to build models. And as you say, there are many ways of modeling various phenomena. People have different conceptualization of what might be uh, the same reality, if there is a reality. People have different conceptualizations of that. And so this notion of how do we try to test models, and is this model better than uh, another model? All these kinds of questions come into play. So I usually tell students, I try to avoid the issue of, of truth, and I, I look at I try to look at the notion of sort of building conceptualizations the that are best to fits. To best fit. Them. Best fit. It can uh, so uh, do you have any evidence that this is improving learning? Um, well, part of the evidence that I have is just student performance on uh, examinations is one kind of evidence. Another kind of evidence that I have. It's the quality of the reports that students do. Since I have experience with this course over many years, I can look at sort of how students perform on examinations now as compared to a number of years ago. I also can look at the quality of the reports that students write. Are they identifying significant problems? Are they looking at how, how one might begin to develop some kind of quantitative model to gain better understanding of, of that phenomenon. So are, you know, are they able to do, since you have all these many years of, of prior exams and things, are your exams harder now than they were in the past, or are they about the same? I would say my exams are much harder than they were. How are they yeah, harder? Yeah. They are harder in the sense that they get more at model formulation in terms of sort of, I, rather than just presenting them with something that they look at and say, well, answer very routine kinds of questions. 
I try to describe phenomena for them, or problems or issues, and begin to ask them questions about, well, how would they begin to try to address this problem? What is the role of science? What is the role of the, the various mathematical methods that are treated in the court? What's, that rela what's the relationship of those things to, pro to problems? And so that, that tends to be much more challenging for students. Also, when I give final exams, for example, it's a very uh, different kind of final exam that I gave years ago. That is, um, at least a half of my examination um, when I'm teaching the course, centers around material that I have given students to read and think about well in advance of the final examination. So I tell them, you know, read this report related to climate change. And it's a very extensive report. And I say, I don't, I'm not going to tell you what questions I'm going to ask you in regard to that report. Because you can have the report in front of you. But I want you to make sense of the data, the charts. I want you to identify elements that may, may not have been treated to your satisfaction. What kinds of critique, what kind of critique might be raised in regard to the author's treatment of this particular aspect? It's a very different kind of thing than the kind of textbook kind of problems that people Typically, give the game one class. Now, <clears throat> some people argue that when you uh, give up some time in the class to focus on these problems, you're taking time away from the mathematical content. But it sounds like you've resolved that problem. So, one of the things that I <coughs> have to think about is what is the core mathematics content that one wants to get across in a course like this? And, you know, this issue about content is an interesting kind of issue. Um, that is, we often think that by moving from section to section and covering a hundred sections of whatever during a semester is treating a lot of content. The issue has to do with what level of understanding uh, are students developing of the various concepts that one's treating. And so this is what I had to back away from in, 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 in teaching the course. And I had to say, perhaps there are five or six, you know, whatever number, perhaps there are five or six core mathematical ideas that I want to get across in this course. And I want students to develop some sophistication with those mathematical ideas. For example, some simple notions of probability, for example, because probabilistic Thinking is so relevant to risk assessment exactly. kinds of problems. So <clears throat> I lay out maybe five or six key areas of mathematics that I really want students to develop some proficiency with those areas. Then once I do that, the issue becomes one of how do I try to reinforce those areas in the context of application? With so that complex problems. With complex problems so that students see those areas from many different Respect. directions. Throughout so they're not the just answering a question on a test. They are actually thinking about this notion of probability as it relates to risk and what this means to have so many parts and whatever. <laughs> you know, they're, they're thinking about it in that kind of context. So it does change, I think, the notion of what is meant by content. Right. Yeah. Okay, the very notion of what is content. So I'm going to turn to something a little different. You have a, um, a huge reputation and a long record of being particularly interested in making sure that uh, minority students uh, achieve and women achieve it in, in learning. Do you see any difference in achievement levels based on using these kinds of uh, these kinds of methods as opposed to traditional methods? So how does how does your involvement um, with the sensor ideals or whatever how, has it had in a, a, any kind of discernible effect in these other interests that you have that you, where you have been a leader for so long? Well, it's influenced 
the way that I think about working with faculty members across science and engineering areas, for example. That's one of the things that has impacted. Because when I think about the diversity area, I look at it as, as, as three major kinds of things that, approaches that I have tried to take over the years. Um, one of those being sort of the academic support programs. And that is to what extent can one stand outside of the regular, let's say, yes, okay, and offer certain kind of support through study groups, and, right. et cetera. Uh, another has to do with the sort of curricula and pedagogical change. That, it, that impact all students, but some would argue that certain pedagogical curricular approaches have um, a differential sort of impact and, and impacts underrepresented students in a favorable way. Uh, for example, I, I would argue that sensor type approach uh, impacts students who are le less engaged with mathematics and, and science in an even more favorable way. So that's kind of a dimension, and then the third. Because it's, do you, do you, sorry to interrupt you, but but do you have a, a hypothesis about why that is? I think that that part of it is an engagement issue. Okay. Okay. You know, my, my sense the work is, that, is about something that, real. That is about something real. What motivates people to study science or, or engineering or whatever can be very different. But I think that for many underrepresented students, and I would also argue. Uh, that that would include women, for example, that many of them are motivated by the desire to do something uh, because they see whatever issues or problems or whatever. My own orientation towards diversity work, my own orientation towards technology and policy work, for example, was highly motivated by internal forces of trying to make a difference in doing something. So I decided to take my mathematics background and use it in these kinds of ways because I was personally motivated to do that. So I think that's an aspect of sort of engagement. Uh, another, I think, is just the whole notion of sort of community and sharing uh, that censure promotes. That is, how people learn and, and, and the way in which learning, meaningful learning occurs. I think that is also highly appealing. Uh, Members of underrepresented groups often feel the least connected to the mainstream of institutional practices. So things that can that it, that have a community kind of orientation, that has a sharing kind of orientation, I think that's another dimension of sort of what what tends to bring certain students into sort of the center of it. So um, you were. You were talking. I interrupted you when you were saying there were big three approaches that you had taken. In yeah. So I had started to talk about one of them being sort of the academic and social support that stands outside of the mainstream, and much work has been done. You right. know, women in science and engineering, right. the various projects that bring groups together in various ways sometimes stand outside of the mainstream, and so I'd also mentioned the. Curricula, curricula and pedagogical approaches, and you had asked me about where you located sensor. <laughs> where I located sensor, and the third that I was just going to mention is sort of the whole notion of sort of policy and institutional policy and its impact on our thinking about diversity and, uh, in particular and STEM education. Let me uh, uh, take that last one. Many institutions distinguish in their science courses, in their math courses, courses for people that they think have advanced capacity in those areas and advanced or, or who have required very specialized training because of some pre-professional activity, right? So what would happen for engineers might be different than what would happen for someone who wanted to study English literature. Um, what happens if somebody... Um, taking a general education math course who's been kind of math averse most of their life, what happens if they get into a wonderful course and decide they'd like to take more? Have you ever had any experience like that? And what and, and how do they how do you make sure that they don't suffer because they've been uh, seen as somebody who wasn't able to do math up until that point? 
Well, I think it's an interesting kind of issue. And, and yes, I have had a number of students who have taken, for example, my course um, in quantitative reasoning, modeling, decision making, and decided to move on into calculus course and, and become math or science majors, for example. I do think that things are not fluid enough in that regard. I that is, that we try to sort of track students. You know, that you're going into a physics major, or you're going into biochemistry, or whatever, very early on. And I don't think we allow enough opportunity to do very um, innovative uh, courses early on that just allow students to learn a bit about whatever subject and decide, maybe instead of this major, I may be interested in doing a very different So thing. that was a real example I, I gave? And you've had, absolutely. You've had I've, examples I, of absolutely. That. I've had students, for example, one e example, my primary example that I think about is a student who came into my course and who came up to me after the first um, class and he said to me, I just want you to be aware that I've always had problems with math. I don't do very well in math, et cetera, and I don't expect to do very well in this course. This is basically what the student said to me. And, and I was a bit taken by that, that the student would be so blunt, I guess, as to say that after one class session, that to take what I consider to be a very defeatist attitude. And anyway, I said to the student, well, I'm going to expect a lot of students in this course, but I'm going to give a lot also. And this is going to be a partnership, that it's going to be a community. I'm going to try to make the class a community. Your classmates, you have, there are other students in this course that do not have a lot of math preparation. We're going to make this a team effort. The idea is that by the end of the course, you're going to learn something that is very significant that I hope will impact the way you think about the world the rest of your life. And he looked at me as if I was on another planet. And, and, but he stuck with it. And he went, and I could see the progress. It's, it's very interesting. When you're getting a lot of feedback from students in the form of their writing, when students are working in groups, you get a lot of information about people. And, I, and, I, and after about three weeks into the course, my assessment is that this person is capable mathematically of doing much more than what he's ever realized that he was capable of doing. And so, you know, he started contributing. Initially, he would just stand on the outside of the group, sort of. And then I noticed him, he started to engage in the discussions about problems in the group, and et cetera. And I was very much amazed at the progress that he made during the semester. He certainly was turned out to be among the top students in the course. I wouldn't say necessarily at the very top, but he was certainly among the top. And the next semester, um, I was co-teaching a course that was on nanotechnology that required some quantitative background for this course. And anyway, <clears throat> I walked into the first class session for this nanotechnology course, and who is there? The student. To be honest with you, to be quite frank, I thought I walked into the wrong room. The, my, my, you know, my initial reaction, to be quite frank, my initial reaction was, wow, I must have walked into the wrong room, because I did not expect, even after the student had done well, because he I didn't, didn't have to take other courses. Because he didn't have to take this course. I didn't. The last thing I thought was that I think I even said something like, you know, is this nanotechnology, what a 213? Is, no, is this nano? I think I just, not to him directly, but I think I said to the class, is this nanotechnology 213? And people say yes. And I said, thank you. You know, it's just that I was surprised. And he said, hi, Professor. And, um, that I consider to be um, one of the more significant accomplishments. Because whatever this person continue, goes on to do, he now has made a major accomplishment for his life. He, he realizes that a whole new world is at least accessible. So 
So David, uh, we've talked about several um, several things. I think um, changes in your um, pedagogy as a result of your exposure to sensor, uh, the applicability of sensor to some of the larger goals that you have um, been working on, increasing the success of uh, people who have had less success in the past and less access in the past. But I'd really like to talk to you about the complexity of taking an idea like sensor and getting it to take hold in a big, excellent institution that has R1 status and is a member of the AAU that already has lots of reasons to think that it's doing lots of things right. Um, so what, what kind of uh, experiences would you like to report on that and what kind of advice would you give to other people who are places that where perhaps making larger curricular changes are a challenge. Oh, okay, so, so David, I think that one thing that I would start by talking about is just STEM education in general within AAU institutions, for example, and other uh, major research universities, and then try to see how sensor might be situated within some of that. Because if you look at, for example, Stony Brook, there are a number of efforts that are going on. Uh, we have something, Undergraduate STEM Initiative, which involves 20 faculty members working on a number of STEM projects uh, across the university, you know, physics, chemistry, biological sciences, engineering, and so forth. So if, if you look at the kinds of things that are going on, certainly the engaging undergraduates in research is, is a major sort of thrust, and that is growing, for example, at our university. This whole notion of scientific teaching, scientific teaching and learning and, and using, um, approaching learning and teaching in a more scientific way based on research related to learning and that kind of thing. So you see that kind of element developing. Stony Brook, for example, just ran an institute along the line of scientific teaching where 25 faculty members participate. There's also a, a good amount of sort of discipline-based thinking, particularly as it relates to introductory courses and the problems that students have in learning problem solving and, and design and a whole bunch of elements like this. So I, I've been thinking a bit about sort of how sensor might interface with some of the things that are, that are going on. And, and, it, and it seems to me that perhaps sensor uh, uh, strategy might be to situate sensor within some of these major thrusts that are going on. You know, that is to say, bringing together people that are looking at introductory courses so that it's not just about sensor. It's about introductory courses and STEM in general, for example and what are some of the strategies that people are using, and then infuse into that the sensor kind of approach. This is the kind of uh, challenge that I found, for example, at Stony Brook in relationship to sensor. That, that is, so Gary Halater, as a, a, as a faculty member in material science, he certainly has utilized a lot of the sensor thinking in regard to the development of a minor in nanotechnology. So clearly his, his experiences with sensor had a lot of impact on the way in which he thinks about that six or seven courses that constitute the minor, how to integrate certain things related to civic activities and having students reach out to professionals in the field and, and, and some of these sort of social dimensions around the work. So uh, that's kind of my thinking is that somehow with the AAU major research universities, one probably wants to look very carefully at what are the STEM education efforts going on in those places. You know, if there's undergraduate research, is there a way of tying undergraduate research to sensor, a sensor sort of pro project, and, and cast it in that light? Um, um, the sort of introductory courses issues and some of the things that are going on there. That's kind of so a, a, a kind of a, um, bringing this into the institution yeah. uh, is your idea, rather than having the institutions come to. That's what I'm uh, thinking. I'm thinking uh, where there is a critical mass 
of faculty members that are already working on STEM education issues. Can we take censor to that cluster, yeah. that group of faculty members? Well, you sort of did that with your help at the, at the Long Island meetings. Yes. Yes. When uh, it was actually hooked to a major curricular, general curricular reform effort, as I recall. Yes, and in fact, I expect additional payoff from that because we're just beginning to implement the new general education. And in fact, we'll start this fall to implement the new general education. And that new general education has both a science and society kind of requirement. It also has an understand technology requirement as a part of it. Also, uh, several people are talking about themes that is, that is, can students satisfy general education? I know this is not new, but the, but the idea of uh, sustainability, uh, other ideas, can students take a cluster of courses so that that could be a community built around whatever? So I, I see Censor as, as playing a bigger role as faculty members think beyond sort of the individual courses to clusters of courses and communities forming. I, I, I think that, um, in fact, one of the faculty members in the School of Marine and Atmospheric Sciences talked to me after the sensor meeting that we had at, at Stony Brook, that conference, the regional meeting, and he talked to me, he got very excited. Uh, but, you know, he's a leading distinguished professor um, in marine sciences, and he started thinking about these issues of, of um, sustainability, and how uh, climate issues and all of this kind of thing, and that it would be nice to develop that theme so that we have a fairly significant number of students meeting most of their general education by focusing being, on the North Shore, focusing fo fo yeah, fo on uh, Long Island Sound, or fo you know, focusing on some other kind of dimension mm -hmm. um, uh, in that way. So we talked uh, about. Uh, Another occasion about uh, some of the systems thinking work that you were, as I remember, systems engineering, other things that you thought was an appropriate kind of substrate for the sensor approach. Uh, yeah, so as far as correct me if I'm wrong yeah. about what we did. So within technology and within engineering, this whole sort of notion of infusing more systems thinking, um, to be quite honest, uh, much of the engineering work and focus seems to be done within a very fairly narrow context as it's practiced um, currently. And so as we try to expand international opportunities for engineering students, for example, uh, the whole notion of sort of there are a whole bunch of factors that influence the kinds of designs that people do. For example, when you talk about an area area like nanotechnology, well, for the typical Stony Brook student, the Stony Brook student is thinking about very high-end kind of applications of nanotechnology. You know, robots in the circulatory system and doing repair and work and all of this kind of thing. Whereas if you look at globally, uh, what are applications of nanotechnology that might save lives, et cetera, issues of clean water and certain, you know, so the, so the very nature, it, it's, it's, it's very, um, not easy to get, uh, I think, faculty within many areas to think in that kind of way, that you really, you really should be preparing students not just to do design on Long Island or design in the U.S., but you really now, you should be preparing students to do design that is global and therefore, they need to understand something about global problems. You know, as, as technology gets to be used in different places over the world, they need to think about what is to be designed. You know, what motivates the technology that gets designed. So this kind of systems thinking, this kind of social cultural dimension, all of these kinds of things uh, need to be brought into play. So I see a role, a significant role for, for sensor, for example, within engineering in that way. Because it, it, um, it asks people to think beyond the very specific problem to the con context of the problem, is that? It, 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 yeah, it, it gets people to rethink the issue of context. That is, there's, a, there's almost an implied notion of context, almost an unconscious 
no context that that people impose on themselves as a result of their own upbringing, their environment, etc. So they may think they are doing universal design, but they're they're very much constrained by their, their own sort of mental view of what are the problems and issues and how do people relate to each other and what do people have available to them. So there's all that kind of notion. And so to try to push that into a broader arena, I think Sensor has a great idea. In fact, as we're talking, I'm thinking, wow, I'd love for you to talk to our engineering faculty members as they as they think about design projects and, and whether there's a role that Sensor might play in introducing people to new design projects. It's a perfect, uh, it seems to me, it's a perfect application of a kind of engineering principle, right? That, sure. Of testing something under different conditions. Absolutely. And so that if you were to think about a solution that you propose for the North Shore, yes. testing it under conditions of different atmospherics or different cultural acceptances or Absolutely. a whole variety of things provides Absolutely. something the engineer needs. I thought that was one of the things that our West Point colleagues were doing is you know, not only designing a better um, battery or lighter battery pack for soldiers to carry into the field, but working on the very hard problem of finding out whether they would actually do it uh, because they would trust it or they would, Absolutely. or whether some slight you know, overuse of battery for another purpose might weaken the overall effect of the battery. So it goes well beyond whether it's a great design, but whether it'll get used and how and under what circumstances. Yeah, it, it calls into question the very notion of what is a great design. Okay, it, that is, you know, that there are technical, te you know, requirements and tests that people run, and so you know, you want the thing to work, work in, in some context. But you know, but what is a, but what is a great design? And that actually is an interesting way of talking about education itself. Well, yes. It's a great design for learning. Absolutely. So when you think of a place as uh, distinguished and, and with many you know, great intellectual assets as a place like Stony Brook, how, how do you see, I know you've made many contributions to, the, to our larger community. What, what do you think needs to happen to encourage more of your colleagues to share what they know with, uh, with folks who may not be as advantaged as, uh, as faculty members at a place like Stony Brook are? So you mean faculty members at Stony yeah. Brook sharing things right. with, with other... We think of Sensor as a place people may come to learn about things, but it's also a, people, a place where people come to teach about things and to share what they know uh, with others. Well, I think that inviting, opening Sensor up in, in, in a different kind of way and inviting some of the people, for example, involved in the undergraduate STEM initiative. You know, there may be a part of Sensor that's just devoted to sort of um, improving undergraduate STEM education. And so you get those people here to contribute something in relationship to what they have been doing. But, what, but when they are here, they are going to interact. It's going to put their work in a very different context so that the undergraduate STEM education work uh, that's going on at Stony Brook has been within a fairly narrow context. It has not played out across, it has not been interrogated mm -hmm. by people at community colleges, even uh, the schools, um, people who are doing lots of interdisciplinary work. So I think- the agencies. Yeah, including the agency. So I think that by getting people here, I wouldn't say by false pretense, but by getting, by, by inviting people to bring to censor what they are doing with undergraduate STEM education. I, I have no doubt that it will be a tremendous learning experience from them in a couple of directions. One is that they will have what they are doing interrogated in this community, and that will give them a different perspective on the applicability of their work. And, and secondly, of course, they're going to see a lot of other work that is going on. And they're going to think, what relevance might that have to their approaches? I but from what I know of uh, the, your colleagues and people at Stony Brook and other distinguished places, they also have a huge amount to offer. I think uh, so. so. I think you're talking about a kind of genuinely 
reciprocal Absolutely. exchange that might start with a sense that I know what I'm doing, but will ultimately enlarge what they Absolutely. know and share it. So then we have someone, as we had here from Duke sharing it, it actually gives a lot of people some courage that, it, you know, that, that, that things can be done. I mean, I'm thinking, David, that if we had 10 or 15 AAU institutions, for example, that agree to come as a part of censor, you know, to, to present, you know, the AAU has the undergraduate right. STEM initiative. Suppose we had 10 of these AAU institutions coming and sharing what they are doing with undergraduate STEM education and seeing how that connects to the other, the other efforts that people are making on that. But that would be very interesting, and I think that we could get people to do that. I think that would be terrific. Uh, and while they were doing it, they would they would uh, learn from people who aren't in those. Uh, Absolutely. They, 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 they have people thinking about, well, how might this play out within the context that I'm working in? And they would be getting ideas from people in two-year institutions and other institutions that may be relevant for what they're doing. I think it would be a great, I, I mean, I certainly would love to be a part of an effort to get a group of AAU institutions, for example, that's such. Let's talk a little bit about uh, the Leadership Fellows of okay. the program. Yes. I, um, so um, you've helped us by um, helping to organize this program. And this is a program that we have that um, recognizes uh, an interest on the part of people who've been involved in the censor program to uh, continue to be involved in some leadership way, um, but it also gives us an opportunity to uh, have some of these fellows work on very specific projects to uh, increase the impact of the program on their campus or share the program with others in their region or to do some other project. Uh, what, uh, what would you say to somebody to encourage them to uh, uh, become part of this effort? So you mean to bring new people to, in? To, and how would you recruit? What would you say to somebody to encourage them to make an application or to nominate, uh, get nominated for this? I think the first thing is that people need to be sensitive to the important work that is going on around them, perhaps more sensitive to the important work, that to be, to, to offer leadership in censor, you know, it's not something that is just distant. Uh, that people are already contributing in various ways. I just ran this workshop, um, Sensor and Mathematics, and so there are a number of people there that, are, that were doing rather interesting things. And so I think that I would be inclined to sort of say, who on your campus, um, who, who are doing uh, important things related to STEM education? What are they doing? Um, and then sort of take it from there in terms of looking at these various practices and seeing how they might relate to censor. You know, again, it's kind of starting from the broader picture of STEM education. And then it's seeing, well, how does that relate to censor in some, in some way? You know, we have a lot of people, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm very much impressed with the caliber of, of people and the things that people are doing at, 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 at uh, an institute, for example, the participants. So I think there's a lot of opportunity there, but I think each of these institutions could probably name, you know, one or two people that are, that are doing very interesting. What would you say uh, the advantages of being a, a fellow? So I think one thing is just recognition for one's um, accomplishment. And I, and I think, in general, people need that. That is that. So that's one place. It's kind of a, a stamp of, of recognition that what you are doing has value beyond the individual course that you are teaching at your institution or the curriculum that you develop for your, your institution and that other people can, can learn from you. And I think the other part of it is the expectation of moving forward. And, and, and have a person think a little bit more systematically about how that person might influence 
STEM education in his or her area. And, and, and I, I think sometimes things are very much organic and that can be good and we just kind of go about doing things. But I think that in, in most instances we could be a bit more purposeful. Purposeful. Okay. Uh, you know, uh, one of the things that, that uh, occurs to me is that the um, people, when they think that they're doing something that has a public good about it or, or a virtue, often think that they it has to be done apart from their self-interest. And I think one of the things that we've tried to do is to, is to say that it's one of the reasons we have a democracy is be, so that we can pursue our own self-interests okay. and pursue them in connection with others uh, and their interests. And so uh, the idea that a person might want to be a fellow because it would enhance their CV is a perfectly legitimate sure. reason for yes. us, provided they meet the criteria and are promising to do the work. Is, uh, isn't that right? Absolutely. So they needn't think of this as just having to do some kind of altruistic thing, although many of them and most of them are extraordinarily altruistic in their approach to, to others and to life. And I think you're right. I mean, people are motivated in academia largely because of their interest in teaching their interest in research, their interest in giving in various ways. And to see censor as just as a part of that. And how the reward system interacts with that is important. We had a bit of a discussion about that issue earlier in terms of sort of being clear and trying to understand one's own passions in relationship to systems in which one must function. And, and, and working out some of that. But I agree with you that um, there should be, people should not be uh, hesitant to realize that advancing themselves and their careers can indeed be advancing censor. And, and advancing the goals and aspirations for our society. I mean, of course. If in fact you succeed in getting students to learn more and be better, more conscientious citizens or better workers or, or competent members of a family, Yes. What more would you want? Absolutely. Are there any things that you would like to um, me to ask you about that I haven't that uh, that you'd like to talk about? Well, I guess one of the things that that I continue to come back to is this rather interesting model for sharing and leadership within sensor. It just, it just strikes me that that is so much at the core of sensor. I think I mentioned earlier that if you were to ask me to give a definition of sensor, I almost would have to think that it would begin with sensor is a vibrant community. Then I would say what it does, because it seems to me that community aspect is so integral to what sensor is that it's hard for me to think about a, a content specific papers or articles or anything, websites or whatever, in the absence of that kind of dynamism, that kind of exchange that goes on. And it would seem to me whether it's online, face to face, whatever, that that element is one that is so critical. You talk about leadership. To me, what we have seen over the period of a few days is an interesting kind of model of leadership because it has given many people in many different situations the opportunity to demonstrate their expertise in relationship to whatever. So in a certain way, almost everybody has led, I, I believe, in, in, in some way. And that's part of, I think, of what What's, what, what sensor is that? Well, I, you know, I tend to think that this is a key point um, that those who really want to increase reform have to focus on because uh, merely having a good idea established and even validated um, through the most sophisticated evidence uh, doesn't necessarily produce the motivational dimension Absolutely. that gets it to happen. When I, when I consider 
my own engagement with censor and why it's so important to me personally. It is the mix of what the censor ideals and in the context of the, this kind of environment. It's what keeps me engaged. Each year, because of the nature of the censor community, each time I return, I learn a lot. And, and, and I was thinking about that yesterday, about why is that? Well, if you bring together a number of people who have tremendous expertise, and there is an environment for a certain reciprocity, then that creates boundless opportunities for learning. I, I'm in many situations. I attend, I attend, of course, many conferences and institutes, etc. And I was trying to think about what's different about this environment. And one of the things that's different about this environment is that it sets high standards while at the same time it creates an atmosphere of respect. And in many instances, you go into a conference or whatever, and you're guarded. You're guarded because there is a feeling of being judged. That, am I good enough? I'm being compared to what? Do I, uh, what I have to offer, is it really something that is significant for this particular group? And so there's a certain jockeying, jockeying kind of thing that goes on. And I feel that at Censor, that is minimized. I feel, and, and that is, I don't quite know exactly how that happens. I think part of the the tone that you set early on with Censor, I think that helped tremendously. You also continue to remind people, uh, attendees, of certain kind of guiding principles uh, for Censor. I think that continues to help. But when I, when I, as I've interacted with lots of people at this institute and at previous institutes, one of the things that repeatedly comes up is that people feel like they are valued. They feel like they are learning and that they can shift roles. At one time, they're the student. At another time, they're the teacher. And they, they feel that kind of fluidity, that this is not a high pressure, that, that one can have high standards without high stress related to a whole bunch of other stuff. And, and so it's made me think about why certain environments are so stressful that you go and you really, and in fact, I would argue, and I think the research supports that, is that when you are, when you are under such stress, you don't give your best, and you're not in a position to, re, to receive you. And I think that is just, just critical. You know, this, this year, um, Eliza Riley, in, in some of the introductory comments that she gave at our um, session for newcomers, because we have this, as you know, this sort of problem because the community is so vibrant and robust that it almost seems like a cult to, yeah. to newcomers. They don't know quite what to do. Yeah. Um, people are so, you know, they use phrases like drank the Kool-Aid and things yeah. like that that actually I find, you know, a little uh, hard to take. But, but, uh, but what was interesting is that Eliza quoted uh, one of our old colleagues at the AACNU, the former president of Paula Brownlee, who was a chemist, who was somebody that I knew back when she was at Douglas College at Rutgers. But she used to say about that organization that it was a community of purpose and not a community of interest. Very interesting. Um, and by that she meant that it wasn't prosecuting, let's say, the particular interests of the AAU institutions or yes. um, chemists or something yes. else, but of a larger purpose of liberal learning. And I, I hadn't thought about that in several years since uh, since Eliza, since Paula said it and Eliza repeated it. But I think there's something to that about this, that people feel like they're part of some kind of purpose. They're, that I they, think uh, that's interesting. Not a partisan purpose or, uh, or a particular um, uh, movement of any sort, or but just to uh, a general sense that there is something that they can do to improve learning and that that learning improvement will, you know, as we heard today, improve the GDP or, yes. uh, or some other uh, connected kind of thing, but, but that, that is the purpose that brings them here. That's I, very I, interesting. I thought about, 
I was just thinking about what you were saying there in relationship to something that somebody said to me recently that stuck in my mind. The person said, I take my work seriously, but I don't take myself seriously. And so, in the sense that somehow I'm about something that is broader, more significant than about the, the self. And it sounds like to me that's kind of what you're also saying in that way, that, we, that that sensor is about something that's broader than a particular person or institution or whatever. And when you buy into that, when you, when you engage with that, it perhaps allows you to back away a bit from some of the individual interests. Or you begin to situate the individual interest in that kind of broader. I think the latter is closer to what I see happening, I think when, uh, when I watch what happens in sensor, I sometimes am convinced that it's bringing people back to something that was their original interest that they've gotten very far away from. You know, that it returns them to some object of desire that they had to make some, that, you know, they didn't go into physics so that they could teach in a lecture hall to no one who wanted to listen to them. I mean, they, and so the idea of reconnecting with that self-interest in the in the service of a larger interest seems to be one of the things that that's, I that's, that's very uh, interesting this notion about connecting or reconnecting because ultimately that's what people want to do it's what faculty members want to do with with students that they're, they're interested in the subject matter and I can think about how excited faculty members get when when a student gets connected to the subject matter so that that can be an exchange in that kind of way. And perhaps sensor provides a context. And we watch me. people work harder when they are yes. doing, you know, that this is not easy work, Absolutely. as you know, right? Yes. I mean, your course redesign was. Yes. It's not easy work, but it's the same kind of thing I think that we say to students that when you are engaged, when you see meaning, when you see purpose, then you are motivated to do whatever, and so that's why students spend hours upon hours working on something. If it's a, if it's a project, particularly the, if it's a project that the student has defined, and they're interested in the, in the, in, in, in the kinds of results that they get. I think, uh, on a, just a very little side note, um, a lot of people in higher education have been concerned about academic integrity, cheating, that sort of thing in students. When it seems to me it's going to be a very different thing to cheat when somebody's counting on what you do. Absolutely. And when you are engaged with what you do and you care about what you do and somebody counts is counting on what, what you, you do, do, I think it puts a kind of moral obligation uh, on one when that happens. Because I often say what is it about the system that sort of and, and motivates students to cheat? You know, that is, so, you know, sometimes it's, it's, it feels like just a game. It feels like you're just doing something for the sake of getting a piece of paper. This is, these are the requirements that you must satisfy. And therefore, that's more important. Getting that piece of paper is more important than the engagement with learning and finding it fun and interesting and contributing to something. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, David.